In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve. And there was perfect fellowship. In fact, it says he walked with them in the cool of the day. I can't imagine that. Can you? Can you imagine that environment, the garden, and God walking with us in the cool of the day? I recognize that's attributing human attributes to God. But there was something tangibly real about that to Adam and Eve. Everything was perfect. Fellowship was perfect. Relationship with God was unimpeded. Until Satan in the form of a serpent came on the scene. And from that day forward, life has never been the same. Introduced into man's struggle was a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle that is real, just as real as it was in the days of Adam and Eve in the garden. And we need to realize, we need to realize that that battle is real today. Adam and Eve came to realize it in a very tangible way. A tangible way that we don't experience immediately because they were put forth from the garden. But in fighting this battle, we must understand it is not a spirit problem. It's a soul problem. The psalmist will say, I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. David, in his penitential psalm, chapter 51, pled to the Lord to restore the joy of his salvation, the joy of his salvation, and to renew his spirit. Restoring the soul, the spirit is renewed. We live in a world, in that spiritual battle, where while we can't Taste it and touch it and feel it. We live it. We know it. We live in a world that is filled with anxiety and filled with stress. We live in a world where, where a spiritual battle is real and Satan is working on us through those anxieties and through those stress points. And what we need then are more Philippians verse 4, chapter 4, verse 8 days. We need more think on these thing days. John Gordon published a book recently in the midst of a number of books that he's already published entitled The Garden. I read all of his books and been fascinated by them, but this one really arrested my attention. In that book, he identifies five deeds that we will not talk about this morning, but we will talk about subsequently. And in those five Ds, he helps his readers. He puts the garden in a parable form to understand how Satan is attacking us today. We need to understand that. We need to understand how our adversary works. Science has proven recently when there is not proper nutrition and the stomach is not healthy, it affects the mental capacity of man. When there's not enough sleep, it affects our mental capacity. When we are isolated, when we're lonely, technology. Does that sound like anything going on today? Isolated, lonely, technology. How are we existing today in our isolation and loneliness with technology? All affects us mentally. So what that means is we need a comprehensive view of how to then protect our heart, soul, and mind. We need a powerful, 
powerful, progressive process. A new perspective, that is. When we face those stresses, when we face those anxieties, when we have family members that are troubled, family members that are sick, family members that are dying, family members who may be health care providers who are caring for their patients or those who are in need. All of those things produce a heavy weight on us. And so what I want you to do with me this morning is walk with me in the garden. In the garden, the first thing we want to ask ourselves in this spiritual battle is, what do we do when we lose our identity? What do we do when we lose our identity? When we've messed up and we say, I have messed up. When we're not as good as others say we are, but we keep working hard. When there's something we love, but others don't seem to love it. When we have no hope, no future. When we have been bullied. When we have been called names. When we have been made fun of. What do we do when we lose our identity? Well, in the garden, there are lessons. And in Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 1, we see how that in the beginning God created man. He created man in his own image, verse 27. And as he created man in his own image, he then placed man in the garden. Now imagine this scene. Here God created man. Man then is initially created mature. And he now is in the garden. And it's not like planting a pasture out here where everything has to grow but the seed from the ground, everything is fully mature. And in that garden are a number of trees. There are two trees that are identified. There's one that's a tree of life and one that's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the midst of all the expanse of the garden, however large it was, the Lord told Adam that he had created in his own image. You can have anything in this garden you want, you can have it as much as you want. Here is the tree of life, and if you eat that tree of life, you will have life. But there's one tree that you can't eat. Eve will say later, you can't even touch it. And that's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, as long as that was the only consideration... As long as Adam and Eve in the garden with the tree of knowledge and all the other trees were the only consideration. It doesn't seem the tree of knowledge of good and evil was even a problem. It seems it was sitting there amongst them and they were happy to live there in this paradise called the garden until, until Satan came and Satan put something before them, deceiving Eve. Eve eating and then taking and giving to Adam the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They sin and therefore God cast them from the garden. But the question is, why did they eat? Why did they eat the fruit of the, why did they eat the, fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? I mean, look, they're created in the likeness of God. Well, in Genesis chapter 3, look with me beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Look at it. Underscore it. Highlight it. You will be like God. And then he says, knowing good and evil. Was there something in the language, don't eat, that they couldn't understand? We'd say something like this, what part of the no, the N or the O did not, did not get? Was there something in the Hebrew that they needed to have a lexicon they could look up and understand, don't eat? How do you parse that? What does that mean? Was it because of their pride? Because they wanted to be lifted up with pride is why they ate? No. 
is because Satan told them a lie. You shall be like God. What's the implication? Right now you're not like God. You shall be like God. But right now you're not like God. And if you eat, you will be like God. Don't you see Satan put something before them? to deceive them, and the challenge that he put before them was their identity. He hit them at the heart and soul of their very being. He hit them at their identity. Children receive their identity from their father. That's one of the struggles when you have an abandoned father in a family. The child struggles with trying to identify themselves or find their identity. Now look at it. Here Satan comes and challenges their identity. You shall be like God implied you're not like God. They've lost their identity. Therefore, they've lost their way with the Father. And they've lost their way with the Father being deceived and now just openly eating They sinned and God put them from the garden. But wait a minute. Didn't they know? Didn't they know they were made in the image of God? How'd they forget that? Are any of us going to forget who our fathers are? Whether they're living or where they passed? We're going to remember that. We'll remember our fathers, our fathers' fathers, and on down the line. As long as our genealogy will take us, as far as our genealogy will take us. How did they forget God? Well, let's answer a question with a question. How do we forget God? The psalmist will say, We are sheep of his pasture and children of God. Here Adam and Eve are children of God. In the image of God, like God. What makes us great? What gives us our value? Where do we get our desire for greatness? I mean, we build a car and we want to build a better car. We go to the moon and we want to go to Mars. Man has this this stretch to, to, to improve himself. Where does that come from? I think it's given to us by God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, that Solomon will say, The Lord has made the way crooked that no man may make it straight. God has put in man a desire to reach and stretch himself. A desire to grow. A desire to stretch himself and be great, to be of great value. Now, where did that come from? It came from his creation, from his creator. Look at it. When Genesis 1 closes, what are the closing words? It was good. There's not a thing said. In fact, Genesis 2 fits in Genesis 1 on day 6. Genesis 3 hasn't happened yet. Genesis 1 and 2 are are, are, are part of the same puzzle. They're not an additional piece. Genesis 2 is not an additional piece. So God has created man, God has created woman, and man has named everything. And God said it is good. What God created was good. And God created man. God created the earth good. And God created man good. Our greatness comes from our creator. And I think overall we know that. But then we'll say something like this. I am just not worth it. I'm just of no value. How could he love such a worm as I? And do you see? We have believed the same lie. 
The desire for greatness was there. It's not the fact they're not God that they make mistakes. They are like God. But where do those mistakes come from? Where do those mistakes start? Well, I think those mistakes begin with our negative thoughts. I think they begin with our negative thoughts. No matter the circumstance, whatever the challenge, most everything is symptomatic. When we talk about stresses, we talk about anxieties, we talk about fears, all that's symptomatic of something. It's symptomatic that here are the circumstances. And now I've begun to focus on the circumstances and I've taken my mind off the main focus. Illustration. Remember Peter's problem when he stepped out of the boat? As long as he kept his focus on the Lord, he was fine walking on the water, right? But when he took his eye off and noticed everything around him in the circumstances, his faith began to fail him. And because of fear... He began to sink, and the Lord rebuked him. Oh, thou little faith, why, forth the, uh, why, why do you fear? Why do you doubt? I think we see this all around us today. When we, when we look at this world, we see symptomatically this very thing. You, you, you look at all the shootings. You look at all the lootings. You look at all the riotings. You look at all the chaos in this world. You look at the loss of life. You look at the struggle with life. All those things are symptomatic. Symptomatic of what? Symptomatic of the evil one. So where do our thoughts come from? Where do our negative thoughts come from? Well, our negative thoughts come from our circumstances. Our negative thoughts come from somebody else because they've told me these things. Well, question. Where do they get their negative thoughts? Where do their neg negative thoughts come from? If your negative thoughts, if my negative thoughts come from what somebody said to me somewhere along the line or continues to say to me somewhere along the line, then where do their negative thoughts come from? Have you ever thought about who had the first negative thought? Well, let me show you where it comes from. And it's in a very subtle way that it appears. Notice again what he says. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What has Satan done there? He's caused a question. He's put a thought that questions what God is telling them in their minds. Second occasion. Same modus operandi in Job chapter 1. When God is discussing his servant Job. And God is telling Satan that He's more righteous than all that in the land. And Satan says, does Job fear God for naught? Just asking. Just wondering. Do you see what that does? It's not an outright accusation, sticking some, his finger in someone's eye. It's planting that negative thought that is there. But you see, so much of the time, we want to focus on the man, not what's back of the man. We want to focus on the person. He or she has a negative thought. Not on where that negative thought came from, where did it originate. Let me ask you, would any of us choose waking up this morning to have a negative thought? Will you choose in the morning when we wake when, will we choose in the morning when we wake up? The first thing we're going to do is have a negative thought? Is that what we're going to choose? Negative thoughts have a source. And they're not from us. They're from somewhere else. Thoughts are not physical. Thoughts are spiritual. Look with me in two passages. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And 2 Corinthians chapter 10 really gets to the heart and soul of what we're talking about here. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at what he says beginning in verse 2. 
2 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 2. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if he, we walked according to the flesh. Notice, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. For our weapons are, of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Listen, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You see the battle? The battle is for our mind. The battle is for our thoughts. No one says, oh, I found a thought today. As though we found something physical. You remember when Samuel comes to the house of Jesse? And he's looking for the next king and he goes through all the sons of Jesse that are there with him in the house. And finally, David is called for. And you remember what the Lord says to Samuel about what he's looking for? He said, I don't look for a man as other men look at men. I'm not looking for one that looks just like Saul. I'm looking for someone who has a heart for God. And it's that heart for God, that very heart for God that man wants to have, that Satan wants to steal, that Satan wants to deprive us of, deprive from us. Second passage, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, is companion to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Because it says, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. You see this, folks? Our battle is not with the physical. Our battle is with the spiritual. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. It's against principalities and power and every high thing that exalts itself. Every high thing that exalts itself to what? To deceive man and his thoughts. Satan has exalted himself by deceiving man and taking captive his mind. And taking captive his mind. Deceiving man. That he is not how God created him. In his image. And we understand that. The psalmist said we are wonderfully and fearfully made. Well, if we're wonderfully and fearfully made, then why would we say I'm of no value? Why would he love such a worm as I? Listen, the adversary is real. He walks about. He is threatening to us. He's not the figment of someone's imagination. He's not the myth on some page. And that's exactly what he wants us to think. He wants us to think those very things. Noah and I are reading C.S. Lewis, The Screwtape Letters. If you've never read them, then this might might not make much sense to you, so I'll try to give the storyline in a way that makes sense to you. So you have Satan, and he has his head angel, Screwtape. And Screwtape has his trainee, Wormwood. And Wormwood is concerned that man is turning and worshiping the enemy. And what Screwtape tells him basically is this, in the parlance of which I'm talking about. Look, Wormwood, don't worry about that. If what we can do is get man focused on all the symptomatic things, all the anxieties, all the stresses, all the shootings, all the lootings, all the, all the chaotic things that happen in his society, then we have him while he thinks he is serving the enemy. You see what Satan's doing? Satan says, you go ahead and come here at 9 o'clock. You go ahead and sing those songs. You go ahead and have that Lord's Supper. You just go ahead and come at 11 o'clock. You do those very same things. You listen to the Bible being opened all along the way. Just as long as, just as long as I can control your thoughts. And I can plant in your thoughts the same lie. The same lie that I told, that I deceived Adam and Eve with. If what I can do is convince you that you are a physical being and that spiritual is secondary... If what I can do is convince you that you are not in the image of God, therefore you have no value, therefore you are not great. And what you need to do is to be like God, therefore I have you where I want you. If you'll just take this fruit, if you'll just take the bite, we'd say if you just take the bait. 
You see, the, th- the, the struggle is for our thoughts. That's why I said in the beginning, what we need are more Philippians for eight days. Think on these things. And all the things he says to think on in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, are opposite the very thing we talked about. What are just, what are lovely, what are pure. All the excellent things that are there. Those things help us identify who we are with our Father. Notice in 1 John 3, verse 2. We don't know who we are today. We don't know how it's going to come out. But we will be like Him. We're going to be like Him. Because why? We are created in His image. And if Satan can convince us that no, you're not like God, you're not in His image then He can plant within us those negative things that cause us then to be subservient to all the challenges that are symptomatic in our world that take us away from God. All of those take our focus away from God. And that's just what Satan wants us to do. God would say, turn off and tune in. Turn off here and tune in here. Tune in with me. While he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways, what he's saying is, I've given you my thoughts and ways so your thought, my thoughts and ways can be your ways. You think I just gave you this to have a nice little bound book for you to sit on your coffee table? No, I'm telling you my thoughts. I'm giving you my ways. Why? Because I know Satan wants you to have his thoughts and his ways. But I'm telling you my thoughts and my ways. That's why the Lord, when he's faced with temptation by Satan in the garden, will say, it is written. Why? Because those are the Father's thoughts. Those are the Father's ways. We don't find the Lord sitting by anxious and concerned, strapped with what's going on around him because Satan is there. He replies, it is written. But don't we see that every day? When we watch Star Wars, when we watch the superheroes, when we watch Harry Potter, when we watch Black Panther, even for those of us who are older who love Roy Rogers, the Lone Ranger, and Tonto, why do we identify with those stories so much? Because there's a good guy there's a bad guy. And in the parlance of Roy Rogers, the man with the white hat always wins. That was why I hated, I despised that movie that came out about the superheroes where all of them got defeated by the bad guy. Now, they did redeem themselves. But I remember watching that and I called Jordan and I said, this is the worst movie I've ever seen. Why? Because the bad guy won. No! The bad guy doesn't win. The good guy wins. But that's our epic story. That's not just Adam and Eve's story. That's our story. That's our epic story. There's good and there's bad. And what God says is, we need to stop treating this world like a playground and understand it is a battleground. And what he's saying here is, God is the ultimate storyteller. And in those stories, every epic has good and bad, love and hate, light and dark. Would it be much of a story if it was just all good? If there were no conflict, no struggle, that the good had to battle against in order to triumph? Would it be a good story if it's all all dark, all bad? Where there's nothing for good to prevail upon so the dark could go away? No. Why are they there? Because God wanted to give us something That is powerful. A choice. Why were Adam and Eve 
given a choice. You got the tree of life on one hand and the tree that contains the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil on the other hand. In one hand, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. On the other hand, you had everything to lose and nothing to gain. You see, God could not demand their love. He could only offer his love. And the recipient of the offer has to choose whether to love. And for God to obtain his his objective of having man in his image, he had to give man that choice. He will say in Deuteronomy, he'll say in Jeremiah, I put before you life and death. But Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 really nails it. In the things in which he says that I want you to know, I want you to know the riches of his inheritance in the saints. Did you get that? That's not the riches, riches of our inheritance. That's the riches of his inheritance. Where? In the saints. I want those riches that are found in people. When my love is offered as an inducement to them, in the view of all the good and evil, the light and dark that is there, in this epic story that is there that they are at the heart of. And they are the prize. Their thoughts, their heart, their mind, and their soul are the prize in the battle. And I want them in their heart, soul, and mind to choose to love me as I've loved them. God is all one. God is all good. God is love. And when we are like God, we're all good. We'll all be one and we'll be loved because why? We are like God. God is love. Choice gave meaning to life. But God had to give man that choice and the playing field had to be balanced. He could not be hedged. That's why he allowed Satan the approach to Job. So that what? Man could choose love or hate. And in the midst of hate, he chooses love. And in that love, he chooses love to be transformed, to be like him. Choice is all about being transformed. It's all about here in this epic story that we are part of, that we make that choice to choose his love to grow in our transformation. But it's scary today. It's scary. That's why some people like to ignore it. That's why some people like to replace it. It's scary to see marriages fall apart. It's scary to see young people addicted. It's scary to hear that that young people are trying to find a sedative to their life by taking their own life. That's scary stuff. It's scary to hear about child abuse on the rise. Those things are scary. But it's scarier not to talk about it. But what's even scarier is this. There are people traveling that path that don't even know the path they're on and where it leads them to. But I'll tell you one thing scarier than that. And that is to know the evil and the adversary. To know one device To know the scary end. And pretend to be spiritual. While walking the path of darkness. You see Satan hadn't changed. He's not new. He's old. And his ways are old but his ways are just as effective today as they were with our forebears, Adam and Eve. And so we want to look at five ways, five Ds that Satan uses to help us believe the lie. But the first thing we've got to understand is there's a battle and the battle's real. The second thing is, we get to make a choice how this battle goes. We're, we're a player in the battle. We can understand Satan's game plan. 
And we can offer our defenses against it. And we get to have a choice whether we choose God or Satan, good or evil. Now, let me close asking this. If we could all understand and accept the lie, how would it change how you and I look? How would it change how this church looks? How will it change how our families look? How would it change how our world looks? If we'd understand the lie that you're not in God's image. God didn't leave man lost. He still had his dream. Man willingly gave up his image of God and took on the image of Satan. But God says, I'm not through. They are my children. I'm going to battle for them so they'll be my special children. And I know the price it's going to take. They couldn't handle it when they had everything given to them on a silver platter. But now they're going to have to struggle. There's going to be pain. There's going to be toil. There's going to be sweat. And there's going to be a death. And I just pray that when they see the death of the son I'm offering my only son, it will shake them to their core of how they are lost, but they can be saved. And the saved is be saved to be in my image. And then live with me forever and ever. But that path begins because I'm tired of making the choices that are dark. I'm tired of being influenced by the negatives of others. I'm tired of being influenced by the negative of Satan. I want those negative things out of my mind so I can think on things that are pure, just, lovely, and whole. And I can what? Give him the excellence of my heart that he created me to give. But it begins with believing a son and having a change of mind about who I'm serving. And then a change of relationship by being baptized for the remission of our sins. We've got to understand Satan's game plan. He does. He knows it. I leave you with this. Every one of us are like God in His image. Don't believe the lie that you're not. We can help you once you come while we stand and while we sing.